born in 1917, right after the First World War. And as I grew up, I knew a lot of our, our neighbors. We lived on ranches, and uh, a lot of neighbors had been in the army. And I took a picture one day to my dad when I was about seven or eight years old of a cowboy and a soldier. I asked him which I'd rather, which would be the best. And he said either one of them was going to be a kind of a rough life. Uh, but then as I went into high school, we was in the middle of the, the Depression. And uh, so I had to work on ranches and things like that. So uh, as I grew up, that's the only life that I knew. Finally, we wound up being a cowboy. And uh, we got $25 a month for staying out sometimes all month. And as the uh, draft was on in the early 40s, then uh, my number came up and I was working on a ranch. So uh, I decided I didn't want to go into uh, the Army as a cowboy, because I didn't know for that. So I decided on the Air Corps, Army Air Corps. Went to Fort Bliss, Texas when my uh, number came up, but before uh, my number came up, they gave me a choice of where, what branch of the service I like, could get into. And I hadn't been to college, but I did graduate from high school. And they said I had to fill out all these papers, and uh, I, they said I could pick my service, whatever, whatever first service, I, one of the branches of service that I wanted to get into. So I stayed at Fort Bliss for uh, about a week, learning how, supposedly, or learning how to march, which I never did really accomplish. It wasn't that much fun. And uh, then I was shipped there to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, right out of, of St. Louis. Just uh, over the fence and I skipped my jump and you could be in St. Louis in about 30 minutes. From there, I was assigned to uh, Airplane Mechanics School in Chanute Field, Illinois. So went up there and it was about halfway through and Pearl Harbor exploded. And uh, they rushed us up to graduate so we could get into action a little faster, I guess. And uh, I went to, uh, from there, to Pendleton Field, Oregon, which was exciting. And we'd fly around the area, and uh, one time there was, a, I noticed on the loading list, there was a Colonel LeMay. And so uh, I thought, well, that'd be a good occupation to follow, because he, was, he made a whole career out of flying and being in the Army. So. Uh, And uh, about that time, they sent two of us to study the B-29, which were just make it in Seattle, the boy it was. And uh, they had three of them, three prototypes, B-29. So after studying that, there were so many things that were an improvement to the B-17 that I thought maybe perhaps I might get into B-29, but I never did, never knew. I sit back and, and started first phase training in B-17s. We flew around uh, Spokane and then we came on down to Blythe, California and formed a crew down there. The uh, Third Army was training 
getting a lot of desert training out of Wyeth, California. And uh, we were training to drop bombs. And there was a lot of uh, confusion, on, I'm sure, on their part of not understanding the uh, significance of uh, our importance in dropping bombs, uh, brave, soften up the enemy before they could get over the, there and do their thing. And there was a lot of discussion about uh, who was the most important, the Army or the Air Corps. And it led into a more serious discussion and then finally a little things, things got out of hand. And the MPs came in there and they were, the, they're the people that think they're in control sometimes. And uh, I haven't always had a lot of love for the MPs, but if there's any MPs, I apologize for what trouble I may have caused them. Of course, they moved us on out. They didn't want to keep us up too long. I missed some of their training. I was in jail for fighting the Third Army. I guess it's the first, their major fight. And uh, several, uh, several of us in the Air Corps, it's always tough, I guess, it's, it's the Third Army. Give them a little bit of practice, you see, before they went overseas. And uh, next morning, they hauled us back to the base, the Air Corps base in beautiful downtown, no, it's outside the beautiful downtown of Blythe. And uh, they marched us down the road in my squadron commander said, Perkins, I want to see ya. And uh, the guard went and said, no, I'm going to take you to your office. Well, I stopped anyway because he had more rank than I do. He was a major or something. And he said, uh, you're going to be uh, Koenig's engineer, flight engineer. And uh, it was a good time to get know all this good news because I all night long, I'd been listening to a lot of other crap. So uh, we trained there, flying and and assigned a co-pilot. And then one of my jobs was to train the other flight engineers as they came in. From there, we went to the beautiful downtown Pio, Texas. And about all we could do was, was fly. There. And we had about 365 days that we could fly. We didn't stay there that long. We stayed there for a while and went through the training. And uh, then uh, we moved up to Puebla, Colorado. Puebla, Colorado. And uh, there we would practice uh, air to air, air to uh, ground tr uh, firing the machine guns. And we all had to be uh, on our toes and uh, the, uh, well, the we flew down, we would fly even down into New Mexico and just put in, uh, put in your flight time, which you had to have at least four uh, days a, a month to draw a fly plane. But we, we exceeded that. Walter Moran, B-U-R-A-N, was a ball turret gunner on our crew and he and I would uh, get around uh, or go to different places together. Well, we were about to find out. We knew we were going overseas and we wanted uh, to remember these places when we came back. You know, my, you might settle down in some of these places that were congenial and uh, you kind of like the atmosphere and all that. 
And Pueblo, Colorado was a real nice place. Well, until uh, one night, the MP and a uh, policeman found Buran and I in a place where, in a sort of part of Pueblo that they said we weren't allowed. Well, we didn't see any, hadn't seen any signs up or anything like that. So uh, they were pretty aggressive. And Buran was a much calmer person than I was. And so the uh, policeman set him in the uh, jeep and just slapped his face like that. Well, this kind of irritated me, and I suggested to the policeman if he'd take off the gun, well, he uh, give him a wonderful opportunity to slap my face, because I'd need it worse than Brand did. And so he gave, he just handed his pistol over to the MP. With the, they were buddies, you know. I'm sure they. I knew how they do. Well, no, no win situation here, but I wanted to get my few words in. And so we went at it. And I was as tough as he was. We went around and around. I had him up against the wall. And I drew, drew back to uh, silence him and hit the wall, broke a finger. I said, okay, I'll go. I'll give up for now. And they put us in jail and tried to keep it from the old squadron commander because the next day we were going to come down to Alba Gorda, New Mexico and, and shoot some targets along the uh, mountainside. So the flight surgeon put me on a cast and I was able to farm a machine gun and all that. And uh, we got through these training periods pretty Pretty well. We kind of knew our job, they hoped. And uh, then they decided it was about time to go overseas. So we went up to, through Kansas, Salina, Kansas. And that was a dry town. Maybe the whole state of Kansas was dry. I can't remember. And anyhow, we did uh, stay there. It was a very flat country, seemed to me like. Okay. Well, we were flying. Our base was in Pio, and it was pretty level country there. But we would get out to the mountains occasionally. But I can't remember seeing any mountains in Kansas. Salina was our last stopping point you know, until we got to Bangor, Maine. I remember an incident. I didn't trust the uh, people on the ground, so I filled up that B-17 as much gasoline, as much fuel as it would hold. But it, anyway, it's not, as I was filling up the airplane, I got too much in there. And as we took off, it started spraying back. I said, well, I guess I'm overdone it this time. And then when we took off, see, the whole crew flew we all flew it overseas. On our B-17, there was 10, 10 of us. There were four officers and six enlisted men. We had the, up front, where I was, was a pilot, the co-pilot, the bombardier, and the navigator. We were all up front, in front of the uh, bomb bay section. And just at the, Back of the Bombay section is the radio operator, the two waist gunners, and the ball turret, and then the tail gunner was the last man. Yep, up, I had to, uh, well, my, one of my jobs as is to fill out a loading list, get every man's name, rank, and serial number, and give to the, uh, to give to the uh, crew chief. And uh, they had to, and sometimes it, you know, I had to check it, make sure that every man, as he came on her, was on the, the right, had every, all his information. And then I had to uh, tell the pilot all the doors were closed 
and uh, this was a, most of us all got in the plane from the back, from the side to, toward the rear, and then I would I would check and make sure that the ball chart was in place and uh, the, the crew was all there going up to the pilot and tell him what he needed to know, a little bit I knew. And uh, I was, I was, part of my job was just take care of everything in flight that was of a mechanical nature. My uh, original uh, radio operator and I were the same age, but if we were scheduling and uh, preparing for flights, you'd change around. A pilot was a lot younger than I was, and we had one guy that was 32 on a plane, he was an old man, and one of my, my uh, of the waist gunners was 29, and I was 24 when we started flying. And I had, by the time I got, when I got shot down, I think I was 25. I believe I had my 25th birthday in the um, POW count. It'll come to me later. So a lot of things will probably come to me later, but I won't be able to tell you about it, send you back a message. Because in 95, some of the things come out a little bit different than I had anticipated. And then went on to Bangor, Maine. And from there we went to uh, Ender Lake. We landed there and then flew over to, to uh, Presswick, Scotland. Stayed there for a couple of days and then went to Ridgewell, England. And uh, it's in Essex County. And it, it wasn't it was a few days until we got uh, our first mission. Shoot, I think I had to stay on standby. How about that? Oh, yeah, we had to. Amazing. And it was to France. And we were bombing the uh, airfield in France. And uh, we got into a lot of little bit of flack. And then after the, after that, three or four missions, we go further into Germany, and uh, we'd have a escort, fighter escorts, a P forty sevens, and uh, that's the only thing I can think of right now. And then we pick them up at a certain point, and they could only go with us so far because they, they would run out of fuel. And then we always encountered a few uh, German players, Messerschmitts, and uh, <laughs> the others that I can't think of. And we encountered a lot of flack. <laughs> and uh, the uh, fighter planes didn't bother us while we was in the, in the flak flying over the flak, but uh, it was, uh, things got pretty quiet. And uh, I guess the guys had a little time to think, well, are they going to make it or not make it? So about the 10th mission, like that, uh, this uh, uh, waste gunner, that was Jones, he was 29 years old, he said, uh, Perkins, I'm going to talk to you. I said, okay, what are you going to talk about? He said, I'm going to get killed and I want you to go see my mother. She lives in Moline, Illinois. I looked at it kind of funny and I thought I misunderstood him. He said, I've written her a letter that you'll come and see her. I knew he'd need a drink then, and I tried to get him on, on with him on a bicycle, which I'd learned to ride in England. I tried to learn, and he said, no, I don't drink. 
So I pedaled on off, and a few days later, the other waste gunner was 19. He told me about the same story, except his mother lived in Walk, New York. I said, she has 10 kids. I said, I'd like for you to go see her. I said, you and Jones have really got the idea that you're not going to make it. I said, it's not a blankety blank German's got a bullet with my name on it, because that's the way I felt. I, could, I never allowed myself to uh, think that they get me. After every mission, they'd take us in the interrogators. Well, there was always a bunch of guys that wanted to be a hero. We had 18 planes that we put up in one, about, that was the most that we ever put up in one day. And you'd always see somebody, uh, they would always have them attacked by uh, fighter planes. And it, with 18 planes, all the uh, 18 top gunners could get a shot at them. And uh, every tenth bullet we had was a tracer. And you could uh, follow it and I bounced tracers off the bottom, bottom of them, but you'd never know whether who hit it or anything. And it'd be guys that would stay there for hours trying to convince the uh, interiors that they had knocked the plane down. Well, I didn't care that much. I didn't, I didn't want to be a hero myself because I, I, I didn't care whether I got the credit or not, but they'd give a certain number to, of, of what they call them. So anyway, credits, I guess, for doing something. I have it up there on my, uh, all, all my medals and all, except the Good Conduct Medal. It keeps falling off. The conduct medal always falls off. We wondered why. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it doesn't have a place there, but or she she puts it on pretty. Much. Norway one time on a flight, and uh, that was a 12 hour flight. And we began to we notice this the light would come on, certain tanks were getting big and low on fuel, so I had to adjust the, the uh, fuel from one tank, uh, move from one tank to another. And uh, as a lot, red light would come on, You'd have to make the adjustment. In flight, there wasn't much you could do except uh, you, know, you make sure that the the uh, props were you know were, were windmill in why weren't turning. If a uh, propeller was rotating you know, at those high altitudes, of course it would freeze up immediately and just fall apart sometimes, they just had pieces would fly off on them. But we uh, 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 had, to, had to avoid that. Feathering is stopping the uh, engine and get, getting the, the, uh, the yes. blade adjusted to where it will not 
catch air and rotate and go around. Because what it does, it gets it enormous speed. It's got to go into the wind, straight in. Where it didn't, it didn't. We were sent a, 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 to um, Ridgewell, England, and started flying out of there. Within about three months, or less than three months, nearly three weeks, nearly half of our uh, organization were either prisoners or killed because it was pretty tough. We got over there in uh, 43, about April or May, I can't remember which. We started flying missions over uh, France, Germany, and one to Norway. Oh, oh, Tinker's Toy was one we flew in. That was named. The squadron commander was Ingenhut, and his daughter was Tinker. I think she was born sometime while we was in training. And they called one of his, oh, the plane that he flew in. Tinker's Toy was the one that got shot down in. I don't think we had a name for it. At the beginning, we had the same crew, but some guy to get sick or some reason or another, they would do, wouldn't want to fly. Then somebody else would take their place. And uh, that one to Norway was on the longest mission that had been flown to B-17s. And that's when we had a problem with the uh, fuel, because we weren't sure. And we had to bomb, we were bombing the sub pins up there, so we just made one run at it and dropped our bombs. But on the way back is when we had to watch coming down over the North Sea, and all the German flight planes were in after us. And we had to, uh, that's when I had to transfer the fuel from one type to another. But uh, we landed in three of the red lights were on by the time we hit the runway. So if it had been about 50 miles more, I don't know whether we'd have made it or not. One or two of the planes did uh, fall short and landed on other strips as they got into England. But the uh, white cliffs of Dover are really beautiful when you're coming back and seeing them. They, I never did get over there afoot. I've only got to see, I only see them from the air. Oh, uh, I, I bought a bicycle in England because I needed it for transportation and uh, I needed to learn how to ride my own bicycle instead of somebody else's. So we were in this town and heading back toward uh, our base. And this kid, about 14 or 15 years old, something like that, he was out cutting grass in the uh, road, roadway. We stopped to got acquainted with him. He had a lot of rabbits and things he was cutting the grass for. And so we went on home with him and got acquainted with his sister and his mother. Their dad had died uh, several years before. And they were uh, strictly English, you see. They were loyal to the Queen and all that, which it took me a long time to realize that this has been going on for generations, you see, and that's their natural way of thinking. They're raised that way. And uh, they were very congenial people. And Joan's boyfriend was in Africa someplace. So uh, she and I got along pretty well. And we did a few things together, rode bicycles together. Then after I got shot down and sent to prison camp, she used to go out to the base to dances and things like that, she told me later. 
this w one guy she got to know a little quite, quite well, I guess. He told her, said, don't you marry an American. She told me that later. He, he advised her not to, not, not to marry. We never did really get serious about it, you know, because she had this boyfriend that was coming home pretty quick. Then uh, after I came back, she, uh, I don't, she might, uh, might wrote me two or three letters, but then her mother wrote her up and said, Joan and Jim married and went on the honeymoon up in Scotland. So it didn't, it didn't bother me that much because uh, I had other plans. It all worked out real good. We went to see them when we went over in 1980 and stayed in their place. They came over to the state that we've seen them a couple of times. They did real, real good friend. Jim died a few years ago, but we still stay in contact with Joan. I guess the next, the next exciting thing was on the 19th of August in 1943. We'd have been in combat a little over two months. Two-thirds of the original crew were either killed or captured by, by the end. We had one-third of the original people. One plane went out, uh, I mean not one plane, ten planes went out and uh, how many came back? And two of them came back, <coughs> ten men. So on one raid to uh, a ball bearing factory in, uh, I can't remember the name of the town, Nardell. But anyway, there were a lot of guns to defend it. But they finally leveled it off. We'd never had a, on this ball bearing factory, we'd never had had a raid on it before. But it was pretty costly. And then the the day that I got shot down, the uh, mission had been scrubbed once. And then before we could scatter out, they called it back. And the colonel said, yes, uh, milk run to our field in uh, Holland. Hills Ryan is the name of the place. The lead navigator hit a dummy airfield and our Bombay Day was froze open. We were on the, bo on the bomb run and they froze open and uh, either, uh, I had to crank them shut. I think we uh, pulled out of formation and I was hit. I can't remember exactly now where we were hit, but the plane just seemed to jump up in the air. Well, I figured it was from flak, I didn't know, from the anti-aircraft gun. And uh, about that time, I was shooting the plane at, uh, right above us. We always had to watch it up above because sometimes they would drop bombs into the break up a formation our formations, and then we kept them pretty uh, much to one side. But, and, uh, and several times, especially that day, I was bouncing tracers off their belly. But they have a, a uh, steel bottom they found out later. You know, you, you, weren't, you weren't doing much good unless you hit them in a kind of a provital spot. But anyway, back to where the day I got shot down, uh, when I think the Bombay doors closed, they had already sal salvoed the bombs because you just cut them loose wherever you have to because you don't want to be hit with a, with a load of bombs. It's so dangerous. So, uh, 
I was cranking up the Bombay doors and uh, I was away from the intercom, didn't have it with me. And I had to take off my chest pack parachute to reach the, the, the crank. And uh, then I noticed the cabin was all full of smoke. So as soon as I got a crank, I grabbed a fire extinguisher. And uh, I, I was about maybe 10 or 15 feet back from my cockpit area. And uh, there was one guy left there, and it was his first mission with us. And uh, he uh, he just tried to tell me something, and, and we, we got a hole shot in our gas because it was sure too noisy. Finally, he just waved his hand and jumped out. Well, I went up to the uh, nose to check on the navigator and the bombardier and that's all gone and the number three in in line in, in, number three engine on the right side was on fire and the smoke was, smoke was coming out and the flame was uh, almost over the gas tanks so I went by and uh, discovered I had needed my parachute so I went and got in and threw it on the hooks and it got upside down and that was through the uh, the rip cord of the, the handle on my left hand I'm naturally right handed that was the only concern that I had I had to train to uh, learn to th throw it on my uh, the, uh, the chest pack is what I wore and I had no instructions on what to do or how to land that I can remember all. They may have just told you, now watch where you're going to land, which I wasn't doing the day I landed. I looked at the altimeter and I believe it was 26,000. I got on something here, 24,000. But we had just pulled out of formation when he got hit, and uh, so I uh, bailed out, and uh, I'd run out of oxygen one time over Creole, and uh, my oxygen froze up, and it was a colonel flying with him as, as an observer, and I just slumped down in the turret there, and he saw the problem, and it, you got, got me on oxygen again. It was just like one of those original TVs. It just gradually faded out. And then, same, same, same way, when I got a shot of oxygen, everything got back to normal. So after that, I carried on these bailout bottles and I stripped on my leg, and uh, just in case I needed. And, uh, I didn't. I got came down between the formation and uh, the anti aircraft on the ground, and you could hear those bullets whizzing by. And I hope they weren't shooting at me. I saw one guy landing as I was landing, and uh, found out later it was a radio operator. He said he bailed. He's the first to out. And uh, I guess he's the first one to hit, but I was right behind him because I waited till I got way down low for a pull ripcord, took on a shot of oxygen, figured I'd make it. I was looking off and hauling for a place to run. I was coming right down over a big body of water and uh, got to checking around and I had misplaced my May West someplace. And but about that time, a breeze came back and blew me inland, and I was about a quarter mile from the, this body of water. And uh, looked off for a place to run, and about that time I hit the ground. I broke some ribs and sprained the an ankle. And uh, 
before I could get out of the parachute, some uh, young people that were working on a farm, they gathered all around there and that parachute disappeared real fast. They had had the silk in a long time. Pretty soon they started going back to work, stop here and there. Well, it's really just one more guy and myself walking along this canal-like deal. Well, that's a, they have a drainage problem over there. And like in El Paso, we got the irrigation ditches. You had to walk for about a half mile to get it across one. And it was still daylight at 10 or 11 o'clock. And this time, the guy went left. Nobody invited me home for supper. So I just stayed out there and after it got a little bit darker, I moved on to across the way and uh, there was a hog pen there. One old hog was in there. Well, I got up fairly close to the pen and I thought, well, this would be a pretty good place because uh, they'd never look for an American in a hog pen, they I thought maybe. At midnight, two girls came by and I got their attention. Uh, and uh, what I'm told, said, don't go to any of these houses. Said the Germans have been uh, to our house twice. They said there's one American they can't account for. And, uh, and uh, so I knew not, not to get on the road, stay away. And I walked about a half a mile and I found a big old field and it had lots of high stacks in it. And I picked out a good looking one there. I thought it'd be real comfortable for the lot of night. And I went in there and kind of made the bin that bed out of straw and passed off till the next morning. I heard this guy uh, saying, Guten Morgen, Guten Morgen. Well, that was close to uh, Buenos Dias or Good Morning. So I called him over there and well, he was just tickled to death to see me, and uh, I told him in my broken English and Spanish, I need some more clothes and some food, because I was getting kind of hungry a little bit. And he said, good, good, and covered my, stopped up my uh, entrance with hay, and uh, I stayed right there and waited for him like a dummy. I should have got, got over to the next straw, straw pile. I heard somebody scratching the hay around and I could just taste the breakfast he's giving me. And looked up and here was a bayonet about that far from my nose and on the end of a rifle and there's two German soldiers on the end of the rifle. And one of them said in English, for you, the war is over. Well, I didn't put up much of a fight there. So I went on out with them and crawled out. They, they had me hold on to a bicycle to get into a field, a hospital-like deal they had there. And they taped up my ankle and ribs and uh, gave me a bite to eat. And this German uh, captain gave me a bottle of Pilsner beer. I thought it was kind of strange, you know, that I, I, I didn't think it was going to be that good to me, you know, give me one of those every day. So I had been in England, and while I observed these what, English farmers, they go into a pub, and they'll drink for an hour on, on one bottle. Well, the crazy Americans, we just gulp it down and get an oven or two. So I enjoyed this one, and uh, it was 38 years later before I had another one. But they're pretty good. Used to, uh, on, on almost every mission that I can remember, you'd see some plane get hit. Sometimes you'd see a bunch of chutes open up, and sometimes you'd see one. So one of my crews, no man got out of it, so I can't imagine how come no one got it. It must have exploded with the bombs into something, I have no idea. 
I did, but uh, none of the crew ever showed up in a prison camp, nor never showed up any place. It was the underground. They used to tell us that if you could be out 36 hours, the underground can pick you up. I had uh, my radio, original radio operator, Tom Moore from Virginia. He got shot down, I guess, two days before I did. He stayed with the underground for over a year, and he went through some real hardships. He said he had to do it over again. <laughs> he he would even never join them. They tried to do the best they could, but some of them, and he suffered and, and died at an early age just from his exposure and all that. Because he had stayed out one whole winter, moved he's moving him around from one place to another. Kept me around there that evening, and a pickup came by with four coffins in it. I knew when I got in, they put me in the back with the coffins. I knew it was my crew. It was just something told me that that's part of my crew. Well, I knew everybody got down the front, so I, there was six, five in the back. And the radio or hopper, that was him landing when I would hit the ground. And uh, I had a mean looking German guard, and he kept a rifle pointed at me. I guess he thought I was running, but I don't know where I could run. We went into a building in the jail, and he threw four big old brown envelopes down. Then he left. Well, I just went through all these, and it was three of my crew that had one dog tag in it, or, I mean, in each envelope, and one didn't have anything. And I can't. It, and I knew who it uh, had to be. It was Everett from uh, Walcott, New York. And uh, we had, uh, as we came out to that jail, we unloaded those coffins in Rotterdam Cemetery. And just three of them had dog tags. And then they kept me in jail there in Rotterdam that one night, and the next day they put me on a, on a train with the same guard, and we went to Amsterdam. I stayed in Amsterdam about 10 days to be interrogated and, and tried to, they wanted to find out Everett uh, rank. That was the thing they wanted to find out. They told me that I had been that I was Keenig, who was my engineer, I mean a pilot, that I was Keenig's engineer and top turret gunner. They knew more, as much about me as I knew about myself. And so uh, after about 10 days in Amsterdam, I went up to Frankfurt and stayed in their nice jail there for a few days. And uh, then from there I went into Stalag 7A at Moosburg, right out of uh, Munich. Stayed there, and one night, after about a month, I guess as I shot down, something happened. I fell out of the darn bunk. When the guys at the next morning the roll call, they said, "What happened to you last night?" And I said, "I didn't know." It. About that time, I fell over again. Well, I kept having those fits. I just passed out. My hand to get cold, or right, right hand, right arm and hand, come up here and just knock you out. I finally went to a German doctor. He didn't know what he had said. This German doctor said, "If you had an R and R," and he had explained it to me what it was because I wrote it rotation and the rest, I think, and I never had had any of that. He said, "You just over, over uh, excited and all this stuff, you know." And so this went on for a while, over a year, and then 50 years later, they determined that I had had a heart attack. 
I said, if I had one, I've had 50 of them. And, and they, look, they checked me and they said, there's scars on your, on your heart that could show that you had all these. Well, I just wanted to get a point across that sometimes if you don't know these things, you do better than, much better than if you knew them. Because when I came back, nobody ever picked it up. Went to, a, I told Lillian after I came back what, what had happened. And we went to see a big doctor there in Alpine, and he said, I, w I don't know what the problem is. He said, I'll go back into the Army. They give you shots and all that, and I wasn't really ever looking forward to a shot. And uh, so they didn't know. He said, no, if it in your left arm, it'd be a heart attack, maybe. But in your right arm, it wouldn't be. And so um, I just... Never thought I had a heart attack, so they told me about 50 years later.